I was going to speak over the music, but that was some good stuff. I enjoyed it. All right, guys, I don't do this like everybody else does it. I have told all my, we had no prep call, because I don't like that. They have all asked me, what do we want to discuss? I said, I have no idea. I will riff off what you people say, but I'm also hyper self-aware. Who, please raise your hand. I'm going to do two raise your hands. Raise your hand if you're a Sportico subscriber. Oh, all right, great. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, shame on you, do that today. Uh, second. Raise your hand if you care to hear from me in the next 40 minutes, or do you want to hear from these guys? Do you want to hear from me? Anybody, raise your hand if you want to hear from me. These are the liars in the group. Thank you very much. So, gentlemen, please, you guys are doing this together. I want you guys to have a conversation, so please do that. I did tell you in our mini prep email that I would start with this. Pretend that we are starting a company, and we have 500 million in seed. What are we doing with it? You guys are in the conference room, you're whiteboarding. Doc, I think I know what you would say, you're gonna do what you do. But what are you doing with 500 million seed right now? For, pretend you don't have your portfolios, we're starting fresh. What are you doing with that capital? Thank you, Scott, I don't have to say anything. I can, <laughs> I can drop the mic at this point. Do exactly what we're doing. I wouldn't put it in sports. You would not put it in sports, well, why not? Well, because it's guaranteed you're gonna overpay massively. And the stuff that's available to put 500 into is just not interesting. I, I try to find a way to divide it by 10 and put 10 $50 million checks to work over a period of time. Um, but if it was 500 million and that was the deal, I'd give it to my insurance company. Right. What if we could break it up? It doesn't have to be one investment at 500. <laughs> How about that for a sports conference? <laughs> Blitz, you got stuff all over the place. If you, you have an empty horizon now, where are you putting your money? Well, I thought we were focused on if somebody handed you 500 million and said you have to invest it in sports or sports media and entertainment, what, what would that look well, like? Well, of I can course, but you ways. know. I, I think some of you know this. Um, I'm, I'm totally bullish on youth sports. So if, you know, broader ecosystem, I would invest that capital in. for, pe in, well, for people who don't know what you're already system. invested in, let them know, Ripken, let them know where that youth sports is. Well, right now, it's, right now our platform is really has been focused on baseball. So that was Cooperstown All-Star Village, merging with Ripken, buying something called Strike Force and Baseball Factory, et cetera. Um, but overall, I'm really bullish on the space. And so we're looking at new verticals in you know, football, soccer, lacrosse, volleyball, um, you name it, right? And, and action sports, uh, et cetera. So I, I really like that space. But if we're bringing it back to what the three of us have certainly worked on uh, a lot in terms of the you know, um, sports industry pro, I would say, and Ted alluded to this earlier, I only caught a little bit of Ted, I wish I caught all of Ted, but he was talking about the value, I thought, at one point of the league, right, from a sort of a national basis versus on a more localized basis, your franchise, et cetera. And I think leagues are undervalued. And so I would be looking at uh, a bunch of leagues. And then the last thing is, and I'm not trying to give Jerry his book, uh, even though he does a great job, but I think motorsports. Um, I think there's a, you know, a lot of runway when there's 10 Formula One teams and 36 NASCAR charters and et cetera. I just, you know, I don't think that many people have woken up to that world from an investment standpoint yet, um, and they will. I, I agree with you. I think the, the, league, I, is, the league concept is, is really valid. They are undervalued. The problem, though, is that, you know, what's a league today? And, you know, leagues really have become portals for media deals. Then there is no league entity because, at least in America, you know, the, the teams have become so valuable that they've almost disintermediated the leagues, right? I call it like the reverse, the reverse of Putin and the oligarchs. I mean, the oligarchs have taken over, right? And, and so I think it's a missed opportunity. I, mean, I actually think, you know, the genie's out of the bottle in America, but you know, I, would, I think you could see, and this is controversial, but I think you could see a situation where the next round of media deals across the professional leagues, you know, they, they go to the owners and say, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll take 20 cents of every dollar off the top, and we're gonna put, give it to the house, and we're gonna capitalize ourselves as, as a real company. That's so interesting to me, right? And it's kind of like, you know, garbage to his credit. I mean, that's what he did with MLS, that's really some. 
And I think we, it, it would be great to see more of that because you know we're getting to a point of sort of terminal velocity here where you know, everyone's trying to figure out, everyone in the ecosystem, how, where's the next round of growth? And I think you're gonna have to look for structural change to find that round of growth, or a different type of capital. Well, well obviously different types of capital is, is being examined right now. You know, Doc, you, you tell me, you're out there raising money. What's it like? It's a hard fundraising environment, no question about it. Um, but that has more to do with large macro issues than it does specifically with the sports ecosystem. We've had greater success than most. Um, uh, I, I can imagine uh, that Blackstone has had great success in the, in the fundraising environment um, because of their scale. Um, we have, but we've seen great traction because they're, uh, I disagree with uh, my colleague over here, Jerry, in, 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 uh, in what we think about this ecosystem and where there is value uh, over the long term. We are very bullish on, on particularly North American leagues. Uh, we think that the construct across North American leagues is, is very investor friendly and, and, and very uh, formidable in the largest single sports market uh, in the world. And, uh, when, when investing in a sports franchise and you get a pro rata piece of that global business that is the league, um, there, there are tremendous fundamentals to that business that are not going away. Uh, so over the long term, and, and again, you can't paint all of us with the same brush, but we have a very long term and, and, and long horizon in terms of our capital. And uh, we like where the, particularly the North American leagues are situated, and, and we like the investment horizon that we're, that we're looking at. Now you guys are in business together, Blitz. You know, they're investors in HBSE. You're in the NBA, the NHL, MLB, now the NFL. Your take MLS. on what Doc said. Yeah, well, I MLS. still remember, I, I've known Doc a very long time, but I still remember Doc coming into my office. I forget exactly the date, but I remember it very clearly. And Doc walked in and said, you know, I think I have an idea for what I'm gonna, going to do next. When was this? 18? Yeah. Uh, Late 18, kind well, of? Well, uh, early 19. So 19, Doc comes into my office, and he's thinking about what he wants to, has been thinking about what he wants to do next in his career. And he said, uh, so I'm thinking about partnering with Ian and um, doing a, sort of a sports media entertainment, but, but sports fun. What do you think? And I'm like, I think my first reaction was, it's awesome. Um, both from the standpoint that I thought they would do a very good job, B, as an investor in uh, teams, et cetera, and leagues, having institutional capital start to come into the ecosystem, I believe is a very good thing. And so I felt like uh, if Doc got Arctos off the ground, um, you'd start to see copycats. I don't mean that in a negative way. You're gonna start to see more and more folks look at that as an asset class in a different way, and I think that's exactly what you're seeing. Um, and it's not just about equity capital either. I mean, there's, there's a lot of institutional capital that is starting to flow around global, you know, kind of sports ecosystem at all, all parts of the cap structure. And I think that's fundamentally good good for the leaks. The only thing it's not good for, to be honest with you, is if you're a new buyer. Because if you're a new buyer, it's pushing the prices up. So, uh, Does the geopolitical world, especially the last week, give anybody pause, pump the brakes on saying the world we thought we were operating in, we knew it was difficult, it's getting more difficult? Does anybody pump the brake on the globality of sport right now? I don't. Jerry, you and I have talked a million times just sort of about the ecosystem of sport. Sport is entertainment, sport is finance, sport is real estate, sport is media. Your view of what you're trying to do, can you give us a sense of sort of the philosophy of Redbird as it goes out putting pieces together? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it really, what we do at Redbird was really started 20 something years ago when, you know, um, I met with George Steinbrenner, and we, we ultimately created the S Network, and you know that model of. But by the way, if I, I love that you're one of the people, one of 10 million people who tells the world that they started the S Network. <laughs> Only you're, you're actually telling the truth. Right. 
Touche. Um, so uh, everybody owns a sports team too. If you walk around New York, <laughs> right, exactly. That's right. And the Yankees, in, the Yankees in particular, right? Um, yeah, but you know what, what I love doing is is finding ways to build businesses, and I don't want to take venture risk. Um, so sports has been such a unique, you know, two decade run for us because the model really hasn't changed. You know, the model isn't really a private equity model. The model is partnering with a rights holder, whether it's a team or a league, and building these terminal value businesses around those rights. And it, you know, in the early days before sports was defined as an asset class, you know, this was a this was really you know uh, a, a great thing for both for both sides. You know, and, and you were able to have these bilateral negotiations and solve for things that they wanted to achieve, solve for problems. Um, you know, it's hard it's harder today, but to you know David's point, you know, with, with all the asset prices being pushed up, um, you know, today. 20 years, 25 years into this, I look at it and I say, well, I can do one of two things. I can either sit on the sidelines and not participate, but you can't make money if you don't put money to work, or you can find a way to sort of navigate that. And so that model from 25 years ago is still how I've pretty much been able to um, navigate that. You know, five years ago, we did take a page out of David's book and, and we vertically integrated and became the rights holder ourselves. Right, so we and really went to European football because the ownership rules really allowed us to do that. And you know, we built a relationship with Billy Bean, who explained to me that I wasn't looking at that ecosystem properly. That you know, that ecosystem with the transfer market and relegation is perfect for Moneyball. Uh, and so we we sort of you know vertically integrated with Fenway Sports Group, which owned Liverpool. Now most recently with AC Milan, and and so those are our sort of platform positions on the right side. And you'll probably see us now go back more to the sort of building businesses around those rights. I remember sitting in Jim Pilata's office probably 15 years ago, and the mayor of Rome was there. And they were discussing building the new facility. Right. I think they're still in that room discussing building yeah. the new facility. Well, he, you're, 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 are you going to get this done? I, I was just going to say. Yeah, I make fun of renderings all the time because I think they're total yeah. crap. You know, well, I, like, I can't tell you. That it is, is, it, you know, when we bought AC Milan, it was so funny. I got more inbounds from people I didn't know in America than in, and in Europe. Um, but the, the inbounds from the people I knew in America from a lot of the professional leagues said, I've lost my mind. Uh, you, you can't do business in Italy. What are you doing? And so, um, you know, but it's been, a, it's been a, you know, knock on wood, it's been a, a decent experience so far. There's a lot we can bring to it, and we are going to build a stadium. And so that's actually happening. So we'll be the first to build a stadium, an American-like stadium, 70,000 seats uh, in Milan, um, the first stadium in Italy since 2011. And that was, you know, um, Agnelli did that with Turin, uh, with Juventus. Uh, that was 40,000 seats. All right, so he's talking about real estate, Doc. There are pillars to sport, real estate, media, finance. Is that what you're talking about when you say there's still opportunity? We, we believe in the big leagues and the growth prospects that all of the teams, all of the leagues will be pursuing those tent poles and those values will go up and you want to be a part of it? Yeah, I mean, at the center of this, of uh, uh, ownership of a sports franchise is, an, is essentially a content studio ownership. You are you you own a you you own a machine that creates compelling content that people want to buy, and in sports in particular, you own that customer, uh, and you in most cases you own that customer for life. I, I say you I say you guys are in the best business because your customers are addicts. Am I am I right? Like what what do you have to do, Blitz? to lose a customer, other than like, okay, my team really wasn't good this year, whatever, that happens. They're still Devils fans, they're still Sixer fans. What do you have to do to lose a customer? Can you do so, like, what, what would it be? I mean, look, you, you obviously can lose a customer, either a, either a horrible experience that they have in your, your building, as an example, et cetera, or just prolonged, Poor performance, like, you know, like. Well, you have to you have to tell them they need to hard. trust the process. What, what's your most recent acquisition? Well, look, I, I was going to actually <laughs> use a slightly different example, I mean, but that you know, um, look, Washington did lose a lot of fans over the last you know twenty years. But to your point, lost fans made money. The lost fans made lost money, it, but the team didn't. Those fans are going to come back. Yeah. So that's kind of what you're saying. But they they did lose them for long periods of time yeah, without I, any question. I made, I made the argument that you were the new Dodgers. Like, when McCourt was struggling with the team, no matter who came in, those fans were coming back, and you had a halo period where yeah, you I, could I, do look, no it'll wrong. it'll take time to get to where 
this team was by, by far. I mean, it, you know, no doubt in terms of timing, but you know how good a market it is. You know how amazing that fan base is, and you just need to have patience and do things right. But I, go, I, I asked the question a slightly different way, which is, you're right, it's an incredibly sticky customer base, right? So again, Ted was talking about sort of recurring revenue streams, et cetera, and SaaS businesses. Um, you have an incredibly sticky fan base, but to all of us, I think the question is, how do we create more fans? And that's both at the league level, and obviously that's at the local level, because the reality is, it's not about your hardcore fans, okay? Your hardcore fans are always gonna be there, they're monetizable, et cetera. What you need is you need to convert more casual fans to hardcore fans, and non-fans to casual fans. And I think about that across our teams, but I also think about that, the, those dynamics at the league levels. And some leagues are doing an amazing job in adding to the bottom of that funnel, if you think about their international activities and, and some of the other dynamics, um, and, and some are a little slower on it. I, I like the broadcast from the NFL, right. whether it's Nickelodeon, are you talking, I mean, age demo, all or above. just in general? All the above, okay? But you, you brought up the Nickelodeon thing, so I'll, I'll do a quick plug. We, we actually owned the company that actually, that all the technology behind all that was, was a company that That's we owned. What I, and like idiots, we sold it to Sony. <laughs> And, <laughs> long story. In any case, um, the number of people that have called me about that Toy Story or Nickelodeon broadcast of, uh, of the NFL, it's amazing. And so yeah, they're opening the funnel in that way. I think a lot about international. I think a lot about massive populations. Look at what the NBA did in China. Like, it's incredible. But it's a 40 year plan. It doesn't well, just happen. Can yeah, you just show up in China and do business? I mean. Yes and no. Obviously, you have to you have to take a long term view of these things. But so why aren't why aren't certain leagues doing that in India? When you look at that population, this is not going to be a short term ROI. But as a long term return on investment, absolutely. I, I like to say, Jerry, years ago when I was talking to David Stern, he used to say, "Do the do the math. Just and you you, you love to do the math. Do the math. Number of seats in a building times number of games in a season." Big number, but a finite number. Then he'd say, look at the world. You approach it, look at the world. Yeah, we do. Um, but I've, I've always, you know, when there was euphoria around China a decade ago or whatever it was, and everyone said that the next big growth spurt in professional sports was, was to go to China and is to go offshore, I said, actually, I don't think that's the case. I think there's more than enough to do in North America uh, because all of these, these properties need to be re-underwritten. Technology is disintermediating the way these things are consumed. Uh, and as David said, you know, the, the, fan are, the fans are evolving and you gotta constantly re-underwrite the value proposition to the fan. Uh, and if you think that, you know, gone, long gone are the days where you can just build it and they will come, there will be the core fans that will do that. Um, but I think you gotta really think about the younger fans, uh, all the changing consumer tastes. European football now, there's no barriers to entry. That is over here live every weekend. Uh, you know, and, and so young kids are growing up seeing European football. And so MLS is gonna have to think about something beyond just messy. So, you know, I mean, this, and it's all good stuff, right? So there's a globalization going on because of technology. But and you, you mean beyond Messi, you mean like Christian Pulisic. That's what, you know, I, I give well, you a plug there. Right, yeah. Look, I mean, th that's a great example. I mean, you know, the, the amount, uh, you know, we, we, when, we, when we acquired AC Milan, we brought the Yankees in with us, um, not forecasting that we would have been able to get Pulisic um, or Musa, uh, and that's been great. And so, you know, there's an increasing you know, two-way mutuality here with what we're doing with AC Milan in Italy and what's going on over here, and that's, that's good. Dave, Ted Leonta spoke earlier, and he has spoken of leagues as tech companies. They have to view themselves as tech companies when the big line item, R&D, commissioners are coming to you, NHL, NBA, saying we need more money from you guys. Are those conversations happening, and what's the reaction to the owners? Well, it's less us handing them money and it's more them handing us less, <laughs> right? If you just think about the p &L, and l at the response? end of the day. Again, I think, look, these leagues, the, the major North American sports leagues are very well run. People are excellent. And if they come to those boards and make a presentation as to here's what we think we need to spend to drive our leagues forward, right? Because we do have to create a different experience. We do need to reach fans in different ways. They are consuming our content in different ways. Um, you know, I'll speak for myself. That answer is yes. Obviously, 
doesn't mean I'm not asking questions, it doesn't mean the word ROI never comes up, but they're excellent, and if they have recommendations of how to spend capital, I find them to be good allocators. Doc, question I get probably most often these days, when is the NFL opening up to private equity? And I know you want to have an answer to that question. I know uh, you're lobbying. I, I know what it would mean for your business. What's the answer that you can give right now? Ask them. <laughs> Nobody knows. Uh, what's, the have... what's the best argument, if I can then spin it, what's the elevator pitch to the owners and Rogers saying this is why you should? Uh, I'm not going to give you our elevator <laughs> pitch here and now, Scott. Um, look, I think if you take a broader view of institutional investment across asset classes, um, an increase in liquidity uh, creates uh, incredible opportunities for innovation and uh, liquidity begets liquidity. Um, the the North American sports ecosystem has been incredibly inefficient over the years, which is one of the uh, one of the catalysts for some leagues opening up to institutional capital. And I think you know we are we are in the very early innings um, and in very early days of institutional capital and its impact on the North American ecosystem to date, um, I think you're going to see greater liquidity across those leagues that are open, and I think that uh, that good things will result for all of those leagues that have opened up. I think the NFL is looking at it uh, very carefully, as far as I can tell, um, and and seeing what's happening across these other leagues and and taking that into careful consideration because as these assets uh, age over time and, and these uh, ownership groups become more fractional, uh, family ownership becomes more fractional, and the inefficiency of that ecosystem will, uh, will continue to exist uh, unless and until there's an opportunity for institutional capital to come in. I remember years ago I bumped into Steve Pagliuca at an NHL meeting. And I was like, oh, hey, Steve. And I was a much younger reporter, much dumber then. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, you're a basketball. And he said, oh, just happened to be around. Like, idiot, I believed him. I didn't follow up. He was there to make a $4 billion offer to buy the NHL for Bain. Seems to me he was ahead of his time, right? I, I, I literally still have the pitch book from them. Can I see it? it Can you share it? I'd love to see that. Oh, that's a little confidential. But <laughs> um, no, in all honesty, I remember when Bain made that bid, and I thought it was genius, obviously, at that price, the league wasn't even thinking about saying yes, but it was during a lockout, and it was a lot of dynamics happening. I, I thought it was genius, um, but it you know, was, wasn't meant to be. Are we going to see somebody go public, Jerry? A sports league go public? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, I, this the stuff that's going on now. I think is a, is a transitional stepping stone to that. And, and you know, if, if these things need to stop trading on a multiple of revenue, and they need to start trading on a multiple of cash flow. When that happens, they're ready to go public. But you know, there's disclosure issues. Um, there's the the, you know, the disclosure issues around the the unions, the players, the teams. You know, so there's a lot of template work that needs to be done to get it ready for that. But you know, as these things start to get run with a, with an eye towards real cash flow, consistent cash flow generation, I think the, the the public markets was ultimately where they should trade, and then it gives you a nice orderly pathway to liquidity as well. What's next for Redbird in sports? Where where are you looking? I mean, I know you have a voracious appetite. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'm I'm sort of in a mode where less is more, and and I'm focused on doubling down on the stuff we own. And there's a lot of company building work that we need to do. We just announced that we're going to merge the XFL and the USFL. So now we've got Fox as well as Disney as our partner, along with Dwayne and Danny. Um, and there's a lot that we can do there. You know, 80 of our players from the XFL after our first season joined the NFL. So we have a real shot in that pro forma combination of finally developing a minor league for the NFL, which has got real legitimacy to it. And then, you know, I've got to build a stadium with AC Milan. Uh, we've got to return AC Milan to the world stage, not just Syria. We've got to figure out how to narrow that, re that revenue gap between the Premier League and, and Italy. That's a three-to-one media revenue differential. 
Um, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a lot that we, we need to do. And then obviously with Fenway Sports Group, I mean, you know, we bought LeBron and Maverick's business and um, we bought the Penguins. Um, so obviously we would like to find a way to look at the other leagues as well. So you should expect that we'll be looking at that. At Blitzen, one of these things years ago, you said something to the effect of your sports investments would not pass the Blackstone Tactical Committee. <laughs> Well, people always I, ask I, I me, like, to follow up. would me Blackstone's investment committee say yes to, like, one of these team purchases or this or that? I kind of break it into two pieces. One, Blackstone's funds aren't going to buy a team. They're just not. But the more relevant question is, when you go through the deep analysis of the equation, like, what would that look like in a kind of a classic investment deck, et cetera? And I go a little back to Jerry just said it, but at the end of the day, Put the NFL aside for a second because its business model is just stunning, meaning in a positive way. Um, and particularly if I went back a bunch of years, like some teams make money, but, but there's not robust free cash flow. And so from a now, pure why, why is that? Why, why, why don't they? With, with the national shared revenue, why do, is it mismanagement? Is it under? Why don't those teams do? We, we had Hal and, and Randy talking before, what the hell are the Florida teams doing? They take our money and they draw 15000 Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a longer conversation than we have. Again, I'm not saying, no one, I'm not saying nobody makes <laughs> money. <laughs> but the free cash flows. Now, in fairness, a lot of it is we make money and then we put it back into the team, right? We're doing things, whether it's real well, estate oriented. Some, some do. <laughs> some do, et cetera. But a, on a true free cash flow basis, um, outside of the really large markets, it's tough um, to generate big free cash flow. Now, I think they'll continue to grow. I think you, you are seeing it. So if I went back from when we first invested in the Sixers, 2011-ish, to today, it's a different p and okay? Um, but the reality, again, is these aren't like just huge free cash flow, you know, sort of machines. So my point being, no, I don't think Blackstone would have said yes to those. On the other hand, if you just take a view, which I have and I know my friends uh, certainly have as well, which is the basic law of supply and demand tell you that there's going to be more people that want to invest in sports and they're not making more of these teams, <laughs> okay, at the end of the day. Even with a little bit of expansion, you're still talking about, you know, less than 1% supply growth, and you abso absolutely have demand growth, and that's not going to change. So what's going to happen? It's pretty straightforward. Prices are going to go up. We can debate rate of growth, et cetera. Prices are going to continue to go up. So on that basis, an investment committee should say yes. Yes. Right. So, Doc, what, I wouldn't what? have been able to convince All right, so he tells me they're going to go up. They're going to go up. That's... Firm, there it is. What's the risk? Is the, is, what are the risk factors out there that would make me say, whoa, 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 Blitz, May, maybe not? Because that affects your business if they don't. Look, I, I, I think we're talking about a relatively low risk environment here. But that being said, uh, to an earlier point, we need to keep engaging the fan, the customer. We need to grow that base. Uh, it, it has to go past the ardent sports fan. We have to uh, broaden the appeal of these assets. Um, and, you know, you, you're talking about a very distracted landscape of consumers under the age of 30 uh, that have grown up in a digital age with, uh, with competition for their their mind share at, at, a, at an all-time high. So you, you know, particularly in the younger demos, we have to demonstrate the power of this content, uh, the, the, power, the, the engagement of this content, both on a live and, a, and, a, and through a, a, a media content distribution that, uh, that continues to engage and grow the pie of sports fans. Jerry, is a young AC Milan fan the same as a young U.S. football fan? Look, our youngest AC Milan fans are in Indonesia. So, you know, that tells you something. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of commonality. Um, but, you know, with regards to, you know, I agree with Doc. I mean, with regards to that, the need to constantly underwrite, re-underwrite that value proposition with the fan, you know, these things will keep, these, so far, sports team valuations have kept going up, right? A lot of it has to do with the scarcity value that David talked about. I just, I just run a little more scared, and I look at it and I say, well, 
that's anti-Darwinian if you believe that things are just going to keep going up. And I, I'm not willing to rely just on scarcity value uh, for that. It's a, it's, a big, it's a big reason for it. Um, and this is the best, best must-carry content in any of these local you know, markets. Um, but I, I think we're, I'm worried that we're, we're at a point where you're going to have to do something else, something extra, professionalizing the way these things are run, hence my cash flow point, to, to ensure that you have more and more of a hand on driving those valuations up. I would really rather have a hand on driving those valuations up than be the recipient of that. I can be sitting, I don't, I don't know how you guys do it because my son is 14, will sit in front of me and I can't get his attention. If you're going to try and reach in through the phone and do it, great. I mean, I'd love to see because then I'll, maybe I'll just call him or snap him or whatever. Maybe he'll listen to me. Right? That's I, all the I, time we have. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I recall a conversation with David uh, about this very issue. And he said, it's different, but they're still sports fans. My son, who is 20, yeah, he's 20. <laughs> um, uh, he, is, he is a... He's not the consumer of sports content the way I was. It's different, but he is every bit a 100% engaged sports fan. I know, Rod. Can you monetize him at the same rate you did you or me? Likely. Okay. That's it. That's all we got time for. Thanks, Sean. Oh. Go, hold on, go, well, hold on, Blitz. No, I was going to make one last comment, which is we tend to spend all our time, not all our time, but most of our time in these discussions talking about the major, the big major sports leagues. Okay, I just want to make a point. I started earlier when I was talking about leagues, et cetera, but there's a lot more than baseball, basketball, football, um, hockey, and soccer, right? And we've got softball, and we've got field hockey, and we've got volleyball, and we, you know, these things I think people underestimate. Like I was blown away when I saw 92,000 fans, I think, at the University Nebraska. of Nebraska's yeah. volleyball game a couple of weeks ago. And, there was a women's soccer match in, I think it was at Barcelona Stadium that got 90 something thousand people. Like, and I look at the passion of the kids that are growing up playing, which is why, again, I go back to like youth sports and funnels and fans, et cetera. And there's just a much bigger world out there is all that I'm saying than, than the, just the major leagues. We'll leave it at that. Thanks guys.